Thomas Edison invented his phonograph in 1877. It was pretty cool, I gotta admit. It was the bee's knees, the cat's meow, the wombat's toe. Then the world was all like, you're doing it wrong, Edison. Edison's invention worked great, but there was a small problem. Edison was shape-challenged, and today we're going to explore what went wrong. I'm Alec, and this is Technology Connections. If you haven't seen last week's episode, well, you're probably going to want to do that now. In it, we took a look at how Edison invented his phonograph, and we also explored the machine itself and how it worked. Today, though, we're going to be talking about Edison's almost comically, in retrospect at least, bad move. The cylinder itself. The phonograph didn't need, and I'm so sorry for this pun, to revolve around the cylinder. Edison held firm to the cylinder concept, but there was a challenger lurking in the darkness. This man, Emil Berliner, was experimenting with another method of recording sound into a wax record. At first, he was experimenting with the already established cylinder. Berliner's effort was to create a cheaper phonograph meant for recording children's material. He wanted to change the recording movement of the stylus from an up-and-down motion resulting in a hill and dale pattern in the groove to a side-to-side -side wobble resulting in a groove that's walls would move laterally as the record progressed. There was one problem, though. A stylus couldn't work. Styli, such as in Edison's design, couldn't go deep enough into a recording material to get a deep groove, which was necessary for the recording motion that Berliner wanted. He solved that problem in a bit of a roundabout way. Rather than record directly into a medium like wax, he used a principle similar to the phonograph. He would use a cylinder covered in lamp black, and he would etch a line into it using a wobbling stylus. You'd end up with a cylinder covered in a wavy line, just like in Martin Veal's original phonograph. But he took this a step further by photo-engraving another cylinder. If you shine a light through the first cylinder, light will come out that wavy line, and with special light-sensitive chemicals, you can etch into another cylinder and make a deep groove based on the shape of that line. So you'd end up with the second cylinder covered in deep grooves that wobbled. The new cylinder's groove was deep enough to run a tall steel needle inside. The walls of the groove were constantly moving right and left, and they moved in the same pattern of the line that was drawn when originally recording onto the cylinder coated in lamp black. So we now ended up with a groove containing sound, just like Edison's. The only difference is that the movement of the reproducer has been changed from up and down to side to side. It might be difficult to visualize the difference between Edison and Berliner's design, but through the magic of 3D printing, we can blow up a simulated groove and take a closer look. Remember the sine wave from last episode? Well, here it is embedded into the grooves of Edison and Berliner's phonographs. You can see that Edison's groove is straight and narrow, but its height varies along its length. So as the stylus tracked the groove, it would be pushed up and down as the groove passed below. Berliner's groove, though, was very different. See, it's not straight, it moves from side to side. And the depth is uniform across the groove. You can see that if you look in from the edge. The needle riding inside would be shifted left and right as the groove moved past. This is the same sine wave as before, but it's now recorded in a different fashion. Looking straight down into the groove, you can see the shape of the sine wave. Berliner was granted a patent for his design in 1887. But he quickly realized that the cylinder was, to put it bluntly, dumb. He realized that with his photo engraving method, it would be much easier to use a flat disc instead. Now, the flat disc also brought many, many more advantages, but we'll take a look at those in a bit. Berliner also discovered that he could skip the photo engraving process altogether with the disc. He could just record into a soft wax disc and use this as a mold to create a hard master. The disc format took a while to get going. In fact, the first discs were released right around the same time that Edison's machine was hitting the market. But they were plagued with a lot of problems at first. For one thing, the discs were small and they couldn't hold much music on them. And also, these early machines were entirely run by hand, so it was very difficult to play a record at a constant speed. But these were all easy problems to fix. Berliner was eventually able to make a disc phonograph with a spring-wound motor, so the speed problem was solved. And the recording time issue was really easy, just make the discs bigger. By increasing their diameter, he was able to increase their recording time from 2 minutes to 3, and then 5 minutes with a 12-inch disc. But if the disc was so much better than the cylinder, why didn't Edison just go with it in the first place? He almost did. Recall from last week when Edison explained the genesis of his idea. I was experimenting on an automatic method of recording telegraph messages on a disc of paper laid on a revolving platen. The platen had a spiral groove on its surface. Over this was placed a circular disc of paper. An electromagnet with the embossing point connected to an arm traveled over the disc, and any signals given through the magnets were embossed on the disc of paper. He had a freaking disc in mind from the get-go. 
but he abandoned it, and for an admittedly admirable reason. Disks have a bit of a geometry problem. If you take a look at a spinning circle, you'll find that areas near the outside of the disk are traveling faster than areas near the inside, even though the disk is moving at a constant rotational speed. It's very simple geometry, and it has to do with circumference. With a 10-inch disk at the edge, the circumference is about 31.4 inches. If the disk is moving at 60 RPM, then it completes a circle in one second, and the speed at which it's traveling at the edge is 31.4 inches per second. But as you approach the center, it slows down. At one inch into the disk, now the surface is moving at 25.1 inches per second, because the diameter of the disk one inch from the edge is two inches smaller. We would calculate this new circumference by multiplying pi, about 3.14, by eight inches, our new diameter, and we get 25.1 inches. Go in another inch, and now our diameter is only 6 inches, which gets us a speed of 18.8 .8 inches per second. So as you can see, the speed at which the surface is going past a point on the circle is slowing down as you approach the center, even though rotational speed remains constant. This would mean that in a disc record, the speed at which the groove was traveling underneath the reproducing needle would slow down as the record progressed. Edison surmised that this would impact sound quality, and he was right. High frequency sounds are caused by very fast vibrations, so the resulting pattern in the groove has very close spacing. You can see this if you look at this photograph of a cylinder record surface. These bumps here are very close together and result in a very high frequency sound. If the speed of the record were slowed down, they'd have to be even closer together. Eventually, you'd reach a point where they'd be too close together to make any sound. Edison understood this problem. It affects what's called frequency response. This is a measurement of what frequencies a device can accurately reproduce. We measure it in a range in hertz, a unit which also means cycles per second. Human hearing can perceive sounds between 20 and 20,000 hertz. Sounds near 20 hertz are very low in pitch. Likewise, sounds in the thousands of hertz are very high in pitch. The speed of the recording medium traveling under the reproducer directly impacts frequency response, and here's why. Recall that hertz also means cycles per second. A 2000 hertz tone, which sounds like this, can only be made if a diaphragm can move back and forth 2000 times in one second. So imagine how this impacts the groove of a disc record. The walls of the groove will need to wobble 2000 times in one second. With a cylinder, no matter where you are on the surface, the 2000 wobbles will be a uniform distance apart. But on a disc, that's not the case. Going back to the speed calculations we made on the disc, with a 10 inch disc at the edge, we had a circumference of 31.4 inches. To fit 2,000 wobbles in that space, as would be required with the disc traveling at 60 revolutions per minute, would require 63 wobbles to the inch. But after the stylus has made it 2 inches into the disc, now the circumference is only 18.8 .8 inches, so we need to cram 106 wobbles per inch to make the same noise. And this eventually starts to be a problem. We can only make the wobbles so close together before we run out of room. Eventually, we'd get to a point where the record isn't traveling fast enough for those wobbles to be recorded in the walls. They'd just be too close together, and what will happen is we won't hear the sound. And this is where the cylinder shines. Because the cylinder's diameter doesn't vary across its surface, at a constant rotational speed, the speed of the groove traveling underneath the stylus remains constant as well. So therefore, the frequency response of the recording doesn't change from beginning to end. The same cannot be said for the disc. The upper end of the disc's frequency response will gradually fall as the record progresses, and it all has to do with the fact that for those high frequency sounds, we need to squeeze them in smaller and smaller spaces as we get closer to the center of the disc. So Edison had a well thought out reason for going for the cylinder instead of the disc. He deemed it more scientifically correct. There was one problem though. That issue of frequency response, in practice it didn't matter at all. These early machines weren't capable of reproducing sounds that high. Remember, this is the sound quality we're talking about. Any decrease in frequency response from beginning to end was pretty much imperceptible. With the issue that Edison sought out to avoid turning out to be a, well, non-issue, it's easy to see why the disc was so much more successful. It was a case of anything you can do, I can do better. This album holds 10 disc records, and they're all conveniently organized for easy access. If each of these records was a 12-inch disc, then this would hold 50 minutes of recording time in this small space. Contrast that to the cylinder, which only holds 2 minutes of recording time, and the cylinder is starting to look ridiculous. Edison did improve these to hold 4 minutes of recording time by increasing the amount of grooves per inch, or the groove's density, but that still didn't best the discs 5 minutes. Discs were also inherently less fragile. A cylinder isn't a very strong shape, so they can shatter pretty easily. Discs, though, were much more durable. 
You can also fit a lot more written information on a disc. The recording doesn't go all the way to the center, so you have a large area to place a label. This label can include information such as the record company, the artist's name, the composer's name, the recording time, on and on. A cylinder, though, could only have a little bit of information stamped on its edge. Any other information would have to be printed on the can, and little more than the song title ever was. Perhaps the biggest advantage of the disc was that they could be manufactured much more easily. At first, if you wanted to make another copy of a recording, you'd have to literally record it again. Duplication wasn't yet possible. But the disc had a handy way of doing it. If you record into a soft wax disc, you can coat this disc in a metal. If you take the metal off the disc, you'll end up with an inverted master. That is, instead of the grooves being carved into its surface, the grooves would be protruding upwards like this. You could then take this metal disc, called a master or stamper, and squeeze a puck of melted wax between it and a solid surface. Let the wax cool, and you now have a copy of the original record exactly like the first. You could do this hundreds of times with the same master. Cylinders, though, were much trickier to figure out. Edison eventually did with his gold molding process, but it was slow, complicated, and it cost a lot more. So it took a lot longer to get the records out to the public, and when the consumers paid for them, they were more expensive. The extra cost of the cylinder began to look even more ridiculous because take a look at this handy feature, the disc. Look what's on the other side. Another song. Eventually all disc records had two songs, one on each side. The cylinder couldn't possibly do that. The final nail in the coffin came from who was recording music for the disc and cylinder. Edison kept things really tight, so only certain people were recording for his cylinder machines. But disc records, there were many record companies producing many varieties of music. You had more artists, more genres, the selections were immense. You ended up with a situation where the discs were cheaper, more durable, easier to make, easier to store, easier to use. They just made a lot more sense. The choice was obvious, go with the disc. Besides the discs being superior from a technological standpoint, they also had the powerful Victor Talking Machine Company on their side. This company, though not well known initially, made a fortune in the market because of a unique idea. All phonographs need a sound amplifying horn to be heard and in most cases, it was pretty ugly. But in 1907, they came up with the idea of concealing the horn into the cabinet of the phonograph. They called their concealed horn phonographs Victrolas, and they were an instant hit. At last, the phonograph looked like something that belonged in the home. Let's have a look at one of these machines. This is a Victor VV260 console phonograph from 1922. Rather than the bizarre looking contraption most phonographs were, this machine looks like a piece of furniture and would fit nicely into the living room. Many, many styles of Victrola were available, from standard tabletop models to extravagant Chippendale masterpieces. Victrolas were so immensely popular that countless examples of companies adding Ola to their products appeared. Even Edison fell into the trap with his Ambarola line of phonographs. There's one example of this Ola craze that survives today. In the 1920s, a company started making radios for automobiles. What did they call their car radio? Well, the Motorola, of course. Aside from its nicer appearance, when using the machine you can start to get an idea of why discs took off. First of all, there's built-in storage. These doors here each hold three record albums, and each album holds 10 discs. On this side they hold 12-inch discs, and on the other side it holds 10-inch discs. You see, 12-inch discs can't fit on this side because the crank runs through this space. This works out to 60 records or 120 recordings, since there are two recordings on each disc. 120 cylinders couldn't possibly fit into this space. For one thing, they don't store very well. You can't really stack them, and if you try, well, they usually just roll away. But discs can be organized handily into this size cabinet. Victrola-style cylinder machines did exist, but you simply couldn't store as many cylinders in a space like this. They're just too bulky. But discs can be handily stored away in just a narrow little cabinet. Score one for the disc. The doors in the middle here are actually covering the horn. Though it may not look like it, and indeed that was the point, this is the horn of the phonograph. It runs underneath the turntable and out through the front of the machine. So let's have a look inside and see how it works. Part of the disc phonograph's success was that it was much simpler and therefore easier to use. The discs are simply placed on this turntable and a small spindle sticks out the center which aligns the disc with a hole punched through the middle. Unlike a cylinder, there's no need to slide it over the mandrel or open a gate, and you can't possibly put it on the wrong way, well other than upside down. The reproducer's design is the biggest distinction between the disc and cylinder. This is a Victrola No. 2 reproducer, and unlike Edison's, we can clearly see the diaphragm. It's this transparent disc of mica. See how the piece here is floating in the middle? It's glued to the center of that mica disc. 
The disc is held in place by a couple of rubber gaskets, and this allows it to easily move in and out, which we need to reproduce sound. Remember, the diaphragm has to vibrate to make noise. Instead of a stylus like an Edison's phonograph, disc phonographs use a steel needle, which rests in the groove of the record. The record's wobbling groove vibrates the needle side to side, which is why the diaphragm sits vertically. This arm transfers the vibrations from the needle up to the diaphragm. The reproducer's sound comes out this hole, and is mounted to this pipework which directs the sound down into the cabinet and out the horn. The arm it sits on glides from side to side, allowing the needle to travel the length of the record. Playing a record was very simple compared to the cylinder phonograph, and much of it had to do with the mechanism's simplicity. Unlike the cylinder phonograph, there's no belt transferring motion or a worm gear to move the reproducer. All the mechanism does is spin the turntable at 78 RPM. A governor regulates the mechanism's speed, and there's an automated brake which can be set to stop the machine at the end of a record, but that's just an optional component. Playing a record went like this. Pick it out, place it on the turntable, wind the machine, release the brake, and simply rest the needle on the record at the beginning groove. That's it. There's no stopper, no gate, just a very simple spinning disc and a needle to play it. There was one caveat. The cylinder benefited from having the stylus float over the surface of the record. Almost no force was placed on it, so the records didn't wear and the stylus was permanent. This design, though, places all of the reproducer's weight on one tiny point, and it weighs over 8 ounces. That could wear out a disc very quickly. There was a solution, though. The discs were made with an abrasive compound built in, and the needles were very soft. The idea was to wear the needle instead of the disc. A needle would be ground down from a point by the record, preserving the record's surface but damaging the needle. The needles were meant to be replaced with each play. That's what these cups are here for, to hold new needles and dispose of the old ones. This did add a layer of complication, but changing the needles was easy. Watch. You just unscrew this little wheel, take out the needle, grab a new one, and tighten it down. It also gave for some interesting options. A thick needle like this one makes a very loud and harsh sound, good for entertaining. But a thinner needle, a quiet tone needle, makes a quieter sound, better for listening to music on your own. There were even ultra quiet bamboo needles that would be used for late night listening. And there were some needles called tungsten tone needles that had a tungsten tip. These only needed to be replaced every dozen or so plays. But consumers didn't mind changing them. It was much easier to change them than deal with a cumbersome cylinder, and it gave them versatile options. Let's listen to one of these newfangled disc records. First, we need a new needle. Then we need to wind the machine, about 30 turns should do. Then we just release the brake and put the needle on the record. Oh, oh shoot, one more thing. This lid here isn't just decorative. By closing the lid, we help eliminate what's called surface noise. The actual surface of the record creates a scratching noise as the needle touches it. By closing the lid, we can help eliminate this noise, and the machine will sound better. So, one more time. After seeing and hearing a disc machine, it's easy to understand why the cylinder failed miserably in the marketplace. They continued to be produced until 1929, but Edison formally admitted defeat back in 1912 by introducing these. This is an Edison Diamond Disc Record, his company's last ditch effort to save itself. They did have some advantages to the conventional disc, mainly a longer recording time and better sound quality, but they weren't perfect. For one thing, they're unnecessarily thick. Look at this thing, it's like three records thick. The Edison discs got their better sound quality and slightly longer recording time, 5 minutes on a 10 inch disc, by using Edison's tried and true up and down motion of the stylus. But this also presented a problem. Those poor suckers that bought a Victor, Brunswick, or any of the other countless standard machines, well they couldn't play these discs without destroying them. That's because the heavy reproducers would put all of their weight on the needle, which would almost instantly destroy the fragile surface of the groove on Edison's records. This meant that if you bought them, well, you couldn't use them unless you bought Edison's machine. And even if you tried to play one, you couldn't hear anything from them. Remember, the needle wobbles side to side to make noise, so if it's being pushed up and down by the groove, what you'll hear will only be a whisper. 
Edison kept locking himself down into proprietary formats, and you can't blame him because look at it, he invented the thing and everybody's benefiting but him. But it's easy to see why his tactics failed. Look at the license on this can of music here. It's very restrictive. Edison prided himself on control, but in retrospect it looks like he had too much. There were simply more options available on the disc, more people were innovating with them, they were cheaper to make, cheaper to use, easier to use. Again, it was obvious. The disc just made more sense. Cylinders lingered on in part because their phonographs could easily be converted to dictation machines. By replacing the reproducer with a special cutting reproducer and using blank wax cylinders, you could record your own voice to be played back later very easily. Recording on a disc phonograph, though, was pretty complicated and pretty much didn't happen except in the factory. Still, consumers didn't really have a need for it. The disc was on a roller coaster that only went up. The cylinder, though, not so lucky. But that's progress. Berliner's idea was simply more practical. You can't blame the public for siding with him. Thanks for joining me on Technology Connections. Next week, we'll be exploring the next big thing in sound. These. What are these? These are vacuum tubes, or valves. These glass bulbs brought us the birth of the electronics industry. These glass bulbs brought us radio.